Um, welcome to a, a first try at a different kind of feature for Forthright. A, uh, not a reader feedback, but a reader preview. Uh, I was included on an email thread regarding an ordinance up for the Spokane City Council on December 5th, uh, Monday night. And uh, I wanted to just put this out in front of people to think about. I will, I've included all of these emails both below, and I'm, I'm just going to keep commentary to a minimum. Um, the, if, if you, you might, you might, uh, I might flag where my thoughts are going with the way that I read it, but I'm just going to read some of these emails to you. And uh, we'll be using this as a topic probably for next week's spokesman review column. Uh, so now you'll have a little context going into the city council meeting and uh, a preview of, uh, of an upcoming newspaper column. Uh, so the subject is Ordinance C36330, which is related to, it's been called a, a landlord-tenant rights law, uh, and it changes the landlord-tenant relationship. And, and in changing the landlord-tenant relationship, you know, both of those sides, both of those points of view need to be uh, rep represented in the conversation. And the landlords do not feel that they have been represented. Um, I'm going to be reading some emails between Ron Devonport, who is a local landlord. He's a, he bought a building that he describes as a fairly dilapidated 11-unit apartment building, which he you know, sweat equity restored, and he, he actually lives there as one of the tenants. Um, he has, he is the kind of small tenant that uh, Spokane needs more of because, you know, he he has the opportunity since he is an, an owner-operator to make the call on whether to give somebody a chance who might otherwise not meet the criteria. And that's one of the issues here is that landlords are pointing out that if it becomes simply too onerous to become to be a landlord, those kinds of owner-operator landlords that are the ones who can give give grace to tenants who eh, might be a little might not quite match up um, on paper, um, those are the ones who are in a position to say I've I'm not doing this anymore. And in fact, we have had some really good owner-operators who have left the field in Spokane, and that's that's part of our housing crisis. So to go on, Ron Devonport is he started this thread, and I will. Uh, tell you who's kind of on these at, at each time, but again, the the full text is included in the substack as uh, as JPEG images. So the uh, the start of the thread, because you know how email threads go, they I've got to flip over some pages here. The start of the thread was a Monday, November twenty eighth email that Ron uh, Devonport sent to the city council members regarding the ordinance, and just like any other person, he's providing his opinion on the ordinance, and this is what he said: Dear council members. Among other things, Ordinance C-36330 would drastically limit a landlord's ability to conduct criminal history screening of prospective tenants. I think it's the epitome of irony that the stated justification for this ordinance is that the City of Spokane, as a municipal government, has a duty to protect public safety to foster safe, livable, and affordable housing for everyone. Because this ordinance then decrees that landlords may no longer screen for arrest and conviction history of prospective tenants more than one year old, except for crimes of a violent or sex sexual nature. And that may sound reassuring, but it's my understanding that community court and diversion programs often have the effect of obscuring the nature and extent of crimes committed. Therefore, the ability to properly screen for criminal history is essential to protect the safety and welfare of existing tenants and of the housing community and environment. And then he goes on to explain why some of this can be a problem. And remember, he lives in the building with his tenants, so this is this is he's one of the neighbors. Um, he suggests going on with Ron's email. At the very least, there should be more categories of crime that are reportable and exempt from the one-year limit. At a bare minimum, these should include eviction due to antisocial or criminal conduct, drug-related crime, any crime against persons, including financial exploitation of vulnerable individuals any crime involving financial fraud, including identity theft and forgery, burglary and or breaking and entering, any other crime that would threaten or adversely affect the health, safety, well-being, or the right to peaceful enjoyment of the premises by existing residents, the landlord, and or the, or the landlord's agent. I hope it becomes widely known among responsible law-abiding tenants who constitute the vast majority, in my experience, 
as to whom you truly favor and represent if you proceed and deprive them and their families of perfectly reasonable expectations as to safety in their homes, uh, signed Ron Devonport. So that was on the 28th, uh, Monday the 28th. He received a response on November 29th. Um, and I'm going to turn my phone sound off. I thought that was off. He received a response on uh, November 29th from Council Member uh, Lori Kinnear, who said, Hi, Ron. Thanks for reaching out to share your perspective on this proposal. This ordinance has been through a rigorous public process over the last four plus years. Both landlords and tenants have had ample opportunity to provide feedback during this time. The inability to find common ground on this issue ultimately won't help either tenants or landlords, uh, signed Lori Kinnear, Spokane City Council District 2. That was November 29th. Then on uh, December 2nd, uh, Ron Devonport forwarded that email from uh, Lori uh, Kinnear along with an email that he sent to Breen Beggs in um, November of 2022. Excuse me, February 2020, an original one he sent in February 2020. And this was Ron Devonport's response to, to um, Council Member Kinnear. Hello, Lori. Thank you for responding. However, would you please acknowledge that your claim of there being a, quote, rigorous public process over the last four plus years, both landlords and tenants have had ample opportunity to provide feedback during this time, uh, is a demonstrably false statement. You seem to have forgotten that I wrote to Brian Beggs and to all council members on 2-10-2020, yourself included, to specifically request public access to the landlord-tenant collaboration workgroup meetings. A reminder of that request is shown below. Brian didn't even reply to my email, and I still maintain the closed meetings were in blatant violation of the Open Public Meetings Act. In fact, the only council member who, had, who extended me the courtesy of replying and acknowledging my concerns was Michael Cathcart. You may not be aware that it was at the behest of Tenants Union Leader Terry Anderson that those meetings took place behind closed doors. I have the emails. If you would genu genuinely like to understand the contrived nature of those meetings and to know about the tawdry shenanigans that unfolded and to fully appreciate how landlord representatives were, in reality, included only to create the illusion that the process was a balanced and sincere effort, I suggest you speak with Steve Corker and Keith Kelly. This is why the public was prevented from seeing and hearing what was really going on. It was never a genuine effort to seek input from all stakeholders and find practicable compromises. I've keenly followed developments and, where possible, attended meetings regarding Spokane's rental housing situation ever since the stakeholder process began in 2015. As a result, I can cite and document a number of examples where City of Spokane officials colluded with tenant activists to ensure that housing provider concerns were suppressed and to sabotage genuine balanced compromise. What we have with Ordinance C36330 is simply a continuation of where City of Spokane officials undermine the interests of housing providers and, most egregiously of all, actually harm the interests of the vast majority of tenants who are responsible, considered, and law-abiding to appease a tiny more minority of disgruntled, zealous, and politically connected activists. As I mentioned in my earlier email, I hope the broader tenant population in Spokane becomes fully cognizant of whose agenda our city council is in reality advancing. I honestly regret the blunt tone of this email, but I deplore all this collusion and pretense under the guise of seeking genuine benefit for Spokane's tenant population. Sincerely, Ron Devonport. So uh, I'm going to insert some why this, why I'm bringing this forward is that I interviewed Keith Kelly and a link to that interview is included on this substack. I interviewed Keith Kelly in December of 2021 on why he resigned from the uh, the housing work group. And bottom line is he resigned because he felt like he was just being used. He was there. Nobody wanted to hear what he had to say. He was just being used so that they could check off the box to say that a landlord had been present. And so there has not been a landlord, as far as I know, involved in any of the talks for the entire last year with that working group. Um, so then, going on to the, the rest of that email thread, um, if you go back, if you go down and look at the JPEGs, you'll find there was a reply to that thread from, um, this, this thread was copied to a, a series of other landlords as well as the city council, and so a couple of those, a couple, three of those landlords actually replied, 
And one of them was Gordon Hester, who replied saying, I, I would agree with Ron that to characterize this as an open process is inaccurate at best as far as landlord knowledge of what ideas are being proposed completely caught everyone I have talked to by surprise. That's from Gordon Hester, uh, also on December 2nd. Uh, there, you'll see in the in the email thread I asked Ron Devonport if I could read his longer version. Um, asked about that, and he said certainly do so. Then there is an email from Keith Kelly, uh, who said agreed. I resigned from my committees as a result of an overt lack of inclusivity, and so I would refer you to the interview with Keith Kelly, which we went into some detail on how those meetings had been going. And then from another one of the landlords that was copied on this longer uh, email list. Dear Council, my name is Daniel Clem, President of the Landlord Association of the Inland Northwest. I'm writing in opposition to this ordinance. I feel that I need to provide some context about myself before I discuss my opposition to the ordinance so that we can communicate authentically and find common ground. He gives a very long description of, of his bona fides and his work uh, with Section 8 program participants, with Housing Solutions for Veterans Experiencing Homelessness, for f working on finding private market permanent housing units. Um, he says, I have won the Washington Multifamily Housing Association's Emerald Award for Community Service Team or Individual for my efforts to end veteran homelessness. Um, he, he says, in June 2021, I was unanimous, unanimously voted as the president of the Landlord Association of the Inland Northwest and was also elected to serve on the Spokane Continuum of Care Board. So um, in that capacity, he also describes um, some of the work that he's been doing with how to, you know, how do you get more housing and um, some of the events that have been held, the work that's gone on with the Continuum of Care. Uh, and then coming back in at the end, he says, recently I was asked to join the Emergency Operations Center by Sheriff Ozzy Knezovich to assist with the homelessness crisis. It was at these meetings where I met Major Kenneth Perrine, Executive Director of the Salvation Army. I invited Major Kenneth Perrine to the Landlord Association's most recent member meeting as my guest and introduced both he and his organization to people I thought could best help house people from both the Way Out Shelter and the Trent Resource and Navigation Center uh, to people who are landlords, he says. And that's enough context for now. So then he has a short part about the ordinance. And he says, I'm asking you to table the ordinance for a few key reasons. One, it will make housing less affordable and reduce affordable housing inventory. Two, the lack of good faith communication to key stakeholders during this process. Three, requiring landlords to be part of the voting process is bizarre and inappropriate. Four, is new regulation really the best answer to our historic housing shortage? And five, does this ordinance help achieve any of the plans to end reduce homelessness that our city and county use? And uh, he goes on to say, I think it is safe to assume that all of you want to help the community with the Gordian knot known as housing. Trust me, I know. It's complicated, it's frustrating, and there are a lot of people who need help now. So the urge to do something is high, and it should be. All the homelessness providers are counting on these private market units to house people in their programs. I've done my part to ensure that will happen. Don't undo this massive amount of work by making landlords exit the industry or raise rents to cover costs. We need everyone working together to end homelessness and to build more housing for all income levels. We need more landlords, not less. Uh, and that's the thread. That was that one thread that that, that uh, Ron Devonport included me on that went to the Spokane City Council and went to uh, Steve Corker, Keith Kelly, uh, Daniel Clemmer, I think I've got his name, I'm pronouncing his name wrong, Gordon Hester, and a whole group of people. Um, you'll find those emails um, down on the same Substack post. And then I'll pick up the clipboard that fell. Because separate from that email thread, uh, there was another, there was a reply from, uh, that all happened today on December 2nd uh, up until about like 6.15 p.m. So then later uh, tonight at 6.15 it's, it's the timing says December 2nd, let's see, i got to look at this. This was sent, anyway, uh, uh, council member Lori Kinnear sent a reply directly to Gordon Hester. He, you know, he was one who had 
that said that he felt that the, the, the process hadn't been open. And this is what she said. She said, hi, Gordon. Prior to COVID, we had four open public meetings with landlords and tenants in council chambers. The room was packed and spilling out into the Chase Gallery, which was also packed. The Landlords Association had significant representation, I would estimate three to one with tenants. People were able to share ideas and concerns. This morphed into a smaller work group to come up with current ordinance draft. Not everyone who is, was a landlord is necessarily going to participate in these sorts of meetings, and there are those who would not be aware of them, which is always the case with highly charged topics such as this. We rely on the parent organization to get the word out. I attended these meetings so I can vouch for the accuracy of what I have stated above. Thanks, Lori. And I think I have actually attended that meeting. Um, but prior to COVID means two years ago. And it was February 2020 when Ron Devonport tried to be involved. Uh, and one year ago was when uh, Keith Kelly, who was there representing landlords, uh, as, as uh, Council Member Kinnear states, when he resigned because he felt the work group was not fully representing all interests and all stakeholders. So... That's, that's the background that I've got. Uh, that's the information that I've been, been provided with and, and what I know of the situation. I'm going to keep monitoring this. Uh, I will be watching that uh, city council meeting and see how that goes and uh, see what there is that needs to be written about that next week. If you have any questions or any thoughts or any communications that you've had with your council members that you want to share with me, um, any, any email that you send to a council member is part of an open public record. And uh, as, as a, a, one of my favorite first bosses told me, uh, when, you, when you write anything down, don't put anything in writing, you don't want read back to you in front of a judge and your mother. Uh, I would say also in these days, you don't want to put anything in an email that you don't want put out on social media. Uh, I have de redacted uh, private email addresses, uh, just left in the, the, the public ones because that just didn't seem fair not to do that. Uh, but I'm, I'm open to, to comments, open to questions, open to any information that you might have, and we'll see where this goes for next week's column. Thanks for tuning in. And let me know if you, uh, if you like this kind of... of uh, I'm going to see if I can even turn the camera off now. If you uh, like this kind of preview and background of of hot topics. We'll see where forthright goes in the new year.